encryption means that you have the possibility of what I called a world of strong privacy, of a world where you, I can interact with you in a way such that nobody else in the world can know what we're saying or, or even who I'm talking to. Uh, and I can make payments to you, and this gets to what you do, uh, in such a way that no, the, the, neither the IRS nor anybody else can trace those payments. And then the question is, what happens? And the answer is, there are good things about that world, and there are bad things about that world, and both of them are likely to get observed. Welcome, Mr. Friedman, or doctor. And if it's not doctor, then why not? Uh, I have a doctorate, I am an emeritus professor, and I don't use titles very much. It's very inconsistent how you're being addressed. Uh, so you would, how, how do you like to be addressed? Uh, David is just fine. Uh, Mr. Friedman, if you like, hey you. Uh, All right, let's, let's go with David then. <laughs> okay, so, um, I'm fairly excited to, to talk to you. Uh, let, let me tell you how I, how this whole thing came around. Uh, because I'm a, I'm a privacy software developer and, and I was trying to upgrade my philosophical understanding on privacy. So I wrote an essay called Anonymity, Privacy and Fungibility. And in that essay, a paragraph discussed the future and the future of privacy. And, and that paragraph became the most popular one <laughs> among every, everything. And, and that paragraph was, was, was entirely based on your work on future imperfect or rather the the presentations that you, you you gave about and and I want to go through that 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 future that you you presented or you were trying to figure out how how the future of privacy might might be uh, but but first can I have some like uh, general questions before we, we yeah. dive into that because because I'm Hungarian and this is I'm personally interested. I, I believe you have a Hungarian heritage. Is is that correct? Well, that's a complicated question. Uh, the answer is that my grandparents on both sides were in places that I think are now in the Ukraine. And at least my mother's parents, and in fact, my mother who came over here as a baby, uh, was born in some place that was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time, uh, or at least at some point it was. Uh, and my I think that, I guess the Hungarian part of it, though, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but at least my elder son tells me that one of his friends had told him that if we wanted to claim Hungarian citizenship, we could on the grounds that apparently Hungary, like a number of other countries, takes the position that anybody descended from somebody who was a citizen of their country can claim, can claim uh, citizenship and that Hungary apparently has an expansive view of what counts for those purposes, which basically includes Austro-Hungary. Uh, or at least half of Austro-Hungary. So I think that none of my ancestors, as far as I know, are from what is now Hungary, but some of them uh, are from what at some point was in some sense Hungary or Austro-Hungary at least. Uh, what, the account I remember, I think from my mother was that, uh, that her ancestors were in a place that were either Poland or Russia, depending on the year. But I gather it was Austro-Hungarian at some point as well but I have never really investigated that in much detail. I visited Budapest a couple of times and enjoyed it and uh, gave a talk there and had interesting conversation with the Ethereum people trying to understand what they were doing, which was sort of neat. And at one point I was on a speaking trip in Europe and gave a talk in Graz, Austria, and then a talk in Budapest. And some of the Ethereum people were at the talk in Graz and they gave me a ride to Budapest. So we spent a couple of hours talking in the car and that was fun. So I thought their idea of how you do uh, an oracle of how software can find out about the real world was really a, 
it's an important puzzle for what they're doing. And it was that they had an ingenious approach to doing it. So uh, what I think they called a shelling oracle, as I remember. Uh, the, but, but I don't, I'm afraid in terms of present day Hungary, uh, while certainly uh, Budapest has produced an extraordinary number of very smart people, uh, I don't think I can claim any any link to that. The, uh, you probably know about the puzzle of the uh, the Budapest extraordinary people. The, there are like maybe half a dozen really first rate people who, several of whom went to the same high school in in Budapest uh, over the same period. Uh, I think von Neumann was one of them, and I don't remember the full list. And my my theory long ago was that there was a super genius Casanova in in Budapest at the time, and they were all his children. But uh, I have no genetic evidence for that theory. You know, people talk about in Hungary that we are a very smart nation, and we we have a lot of very smart people. But I I don't know if it's only a propaganda or, or it's true. Yeah. I think it is true that there that there was a ex, a single extraordinary cluster of people coming out of Budapest at one time, but I have no idea what the average level of, of Hungarians is other than they managed to speak Hungarian, which I gather is a bit of a trick. Uh, Who gave you the orange peel? Orange peel. I'm afraid I do not remember having given an orange peel. I was on the cypherpunk list mailing list for a while a long time ago and had some interesting ideas from those people uh and but i don't think i remember getting any orange peel from anybody uh i have gone online and looked at what you're doing which i thought was very interesting and clever and was basically the old idea of anonymous remailers except that you're applying it uh not to tracing contacts but to tracing transactions to to uh, as a way of because I've been interested for a, quite a while that of course when I started writing about this stuff there were no cryptocurrencies and what I was imagining was Xiaomi and digital cash which as you probably know is a perfectly viable way of doing anonymous cash but it requires a bank and the prop my guess is the reason that's never come into existence is that once you have a, a, a real digital currency, money laundering laws become unenforceable, that naturally enough, governments like to be able to enforce their laws. And in order to have a bank, you need a reasonably respectable country where people trust the bank, uh, you know, have a working legal system and so forth. And uh, that requires a reasonably developed country. And all those developed countries have governments that don't want there to be an anonymous currency. So I think that's what's going on. And the really ingenious thing about Bitcoin uh, and its, its its successors is they don't require an issuer uh, and that they don't require a trusted issuer uh, and that therefore they can exist with no government sanction. You said is that Chomi and Ikesh has not been, been it, it didn't get adopted or or, or didn't didn't happen before b because of governments, right? Basically, right. that's the idea. That's and my my conjecture of why it didn't happen is because you needed a reliable bank, and banks are regulated by governments, and governments don't want Chamian digital cash to happen for perfectly understandable reasons. And and that is what people think, and that might be right why why it didn't happen but i had an idea and and i i came to believe that why chomi and ikash didn't happen and still didn't happen today because i reviewed their literature especially the latest 2019 2020 papers and it looks like chomi and ikash have not been like it doesn't work properly just yet the user experience is terrible. They are just trying to figure out how to divide the coins. Uh, and, you know, like, I, I think it didn't happen because it, it, the technology just wasn't there. Uh, but, but anyway, this wasn't the focus of my research. This was just a notion. So there's something to keep in mind that it might not be the government that, <laughs> that killed Xiaomi and Ikesh, but but it wasn't invented yet. Hmm. Yeah, uh, any, anyhow, so, so regarding the orange peel, it's, it's a, 
it's it's something coming from the matrix which i still did not see i have not seen the matrix i know it existed but i i i watch almost no movies oh boy so so so, so but but i'm familiar with the meme that you know here is the red pill and here is the other pill one gives you um and, and one makes you happy and let you live your life in a happy but i'm sorry I was hearing peel, P-E-E-L, as in the peel of an orange, not oh. peel, as in, I have not seen The Matrix, but I am familiar with the various terms about an orange pill or some other pill, and one of them lets you see reality, and one of them leaves you inside the virtual reality that you're enjoying. Yes, so they call Bitcoin the orange pill, and, and you know, one of the, the most prominent Bitcoin personality called Tour Deemster uh, actually got the orange peel from you. Nice. <laughs> I'm not sure if you know him or remember, but uh, yeah. Predicting the future. How easy it is, how hard it is, is what you're doing basically just science fiction or or you're trying to think about carefully? I wouldn't say that in Future Imperfect, I'm trying to predict the future. What I'm trying to do, what I tried to do in that book is to say, here are technologies, here is what the world might look like as a result of that technology. I think everything is much too uncertain, uh, especially after you know 10 or 20 years forward to say what will happen. But you can say, here is one plausible conjecture, one picture that makes sense, and it might happen. Uh, so let me give you an example that somebody else did. Uh, and that's, there's a book called by David Brin called The Transparent Society. Uh, I'm not really a fan of David Brin's for various reasons, but it's an interesting book. And he's discussing the results, not of encryption, but of surveillance. And he makes the point that uh, on the one hand, uh, you're going to have a society where everything is where, where the police know everything you've done, so to speak. But he says the one constraint on that is to make the transparency go in both directions. So we can see everything they're doing and that'll constrain them. And my initial reaction to that was that wouldn't work at all because they're going to control the mechanisms for surveillance. But I was wrong because what in fact turned out to happen was that Bryn, Bryn, not Bryn's world didn't exactly happen, but we've now got a world where everybody's got a video camera in his pocket because of his cell phone. And the result is that police indeed are facing a fairly serious problem from their standpoint, that if they beat somebody up, it's probably on, on camera and that gets them into trouble. Uh, so in that sense, it seemed to me that although the details of what Bryn was saying were probably wrong, he had a very useful insight for the ways in which technological change change things. And similarly, uh, in my case, uh, I can't tell you what the future will be, but I can tell you that this technology raises these possibilities which could result in this kind of society. And uh, my earliest really attempt at that was my article, The World of Strong Privacy, which was, I was just checking, published back in 1996. Uh, and that was about encryption and related technologies. Uh, but I've got a variety of other things of that sort that that if you think about, for example, the implications of reproductive technology, that I like to say that paternity testing is the stealth reproductive technology because it doesn't seem very scary. We've had it for a while, but it changes one of the central facts of human history. Namely, it's a wise child who knows his father. So the fact that we now have a way of checking paternity me might mean gives the potential for different mating institutions than we've had in the past that's that through all of human history the only way a man could be sure which children were his was to have exclusive sexual access to the to the to the mother uh hence ordinary marriage institutions they have other functions as well so we may we may retain them oh, but but the fact that that constraint has gone away means that the space of possibilities has opened up. And similarly for other technologies, that's what the book is really in a sense about. Um, and encryption means that you have the possibility of what I called a world of strong privacy, of a world where you, I can interact with you in a way such that nobody else in the world can know what we're saying or, or even who I'm talking to.
uh, and I can make payments to you, and this gets to what you do, uh, in such a way that no, the, the, neither the IRS nor anybody else can trace those payments. And then the question is, what happens? And the answer is, there are good things about that world, and there are bad things about that world, and both of them are likely to get observed. But prediction is too strong. Uh, so, what do you think about that idea that you can't predict the future because what how things are going to happen is based on individuals action for example our our present would look completely different if there would have not been a bill gates or if there would have not been a uh, steve jobs like are we is it impossible to predict the future because of individuals or the economic incentives just gonna point to that direction anyway? Depends, depends how accurately you want to predict it. That uh, I was a very early Macintosh user, but I happen to remember that at the time the Macintosh came out, it actually had a competitor. I think it had two competitors, as I remember. That is, there were two other firms that were doing uh, essentially the same thing. They were doing a graphic interface machine, I think even using a Motorola 68000 chip, which had enough horsepower to run a graphic interface. And it turned out that the other two didn't, didn't were not business successes. Uh, Atari, I think, was one of them, and I forget who the other one was, uh, and the Apple was. But my guess is that if you really wanted to, 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 to get that bit, you've got to push it back to the work that was being done at Xerox Park, which was developing the graphic interface, which is what made the Mac such a wonderful machine. Uh, and uh, so, but even then, no, I, you surely can't predict in detail. Uh, and there are, in a sense, forks. There are times when it might go one way or might go another way. That, that one of the points that I, I make in, in Future Imperfect is that some of my futures won't develop if others develop. That if, you know, if, we, we, if we're all wiped out by a biological plague created via nanotech by some stupid high school kid in his basement, then we're not going to be able to get the world of super intelligent computers that I am discussing in another chapter. So, so I, I don't think you know which way it's going to go, but I think you can certainly explore plausible possibilities for it. Uh, and I don't think the world would be very different if Bill Gates or Steve Jobs hadn't existed. It would be a little bit different, uh, but I think that those are probably both cases where the technology was going in that direction. Uh, I remember prior to the Macintosh, uh, I was running a an LNW80 was my computer, and it was a super clone of the TRS-80. And there were multiple operating systems for it. There was a competitive market for operating systems. And the operating system I was using had what was, in a sense, a very primitive graphic interface. It wasn't nearly as, as good a graphic interface as the Mac. Uh, and it was using a character-oriented screen. But it was done in such a way that you were doing things by moving a cursor around and clicking on things rather than by typing in text. So in that case, it was a sort of using the machinery for the command line system for, for something other than a command line interface. So I think the graphic interface would have come and come without without Steve Jobs. And I think that, you know, I'm not sure that Bill Gates really matters very much that much because, you know, they the the IBM PC was a was a a very popular machine, but before that existed, there was the TRS-80, which was a popular machine. There was the Apple II, which was a popular machine. There was the Sinclair off in, in the UK, which was a popular machine. So I think that stuff would have developed in a not too different way anyway. How about open source without Steve Jobs and Bill Gates? Yes, that's interesting. Ethan the word much earlier. Open source is the better case in a sense, in the sense that that comes out of, I think, I think maybe two or three people, uh, one of them a uh, crazy supercomputer, super programmer, and one of them, I think, a crazy Finn. Uh, and I'm not sure that would have happened otherwise. I don't know. But that's that's a somewhat subtler idea, as it were. And it was sort of neat that it worked. 
uh, but the yeah, but no, but I don't think I'm claiming you can predict the future, but I'm claiming that you can say useful things about the future. The 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 thing I'm most interested in at the moment, of course, is whether they solve the aging problem because I, like you, am dying of a lethal disease, uh, and I'd like them to find a cure for it. Uh, but um, that's that's actually something that's very interesting to me too because I'm thinking a lot about. What should you do with your time? And because basically time is the only thing that you have for yourself and yes, you can waste it. Or what would be the opposite of wasting your time? Working on uh, longevity, right? That's the opposite of wasting your time. You're creating wow. more time for yourself. Yeah. Um, it might be. But the problem with that is that it's not gonna be a one person job. And you're then, I mean, I'm all in favor of your solving the problem, but if you solve it, you solve it for me too. Uh, and that's the standard public good problem. The fact that you are producing a good that many people benefit by and you don't have much control who gets it. And therefore your incentive is limited to your own, your own benefit, though that's a pretty strong incentive. In this case, it's true, but no, <clears throat> but of course, for what's worth, worth doing, you then have the question of, for how you should spend your time the question is ultimately what are the values what's worth doing and that's not a question the philosophers have a good answer to uh, um yes yes exactly like what what has meaning right and mm -hmm. it's such a complex question that you need yeah. a lot of time to figure out anything useful uh -huh. about that so you might as well work on longevity for now <laughs> Yeah. So anyhow, let's let's move on to to the world of strong privacy, and let me explain what I would like to go through with. Uh, you, you have a vision of that there there could be a surveillance uh, world or a privacy world. The surveillance tech and the privacy tech is at odds at each other. Uh, one is stronger online, the other is stronger offline, and 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 so I would like to talk a bit about the the bad part, the the offline surveillance part, and and then move on to and zoom into more like the the online uh, strong privacy case yes. because that's something that interests me more. So. I think you already touched the the offline part, which was the the basic idea. Is 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 this the basic idea? We have public cameras and face recognition and data processing, and you put them together, and the government knows everyone. Where is everyone at all times, right? Uh, Initially, in public places. But then I suggest that whether it's government or private surveillance, as the technology improves, there are going to be fewer and fewer private places. And and the mosquito cameras, right? Yes, yeah, that's where you <laughs> end up. How much of this I got from David Grin, I don't know, but he's really the inspiration for these ideas. And as I say, I've quarreled with him on my blog a couple of times, and I don't really think highly of him, but he clearly had some interesting and useful ideas on this subject. And I believe in stealing useful ideas when I can find them. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, that, that, that you end up with uh, video cameras with the size and aerodynamics characteristics of mosquitoes, and then it's very hard to have any place really private. Uh, mm -hmm. Now there may be counter moves as well. You know, you don't know how technologies are going to develop, and maybe there will be some clever way of keeping everything private. But my guess is is probably not. And David Brame argues, and I, I think you agree now that that uh, this th this this isn't only the governments who who are Absolutely. going to to watch everyone, but everyone is watching everyone at all times. That's probably. that's the extreme version of it, and. What's happening, what's actually happening so far is not that, but that there is the risk that if you do anything, somebody else will be watching you and be recording it. Uh, and, uh, but 
you could certainly imagine a system, and I think it's a system that Brian is in favor of, really, in which you have the surveillance camera, it's all in that, and everybody has access to it. Uh, and that would be the sort of the extreme version. And then sort of my response at the time is the police will make sure that the cameras in the police station don't function when they want to do something they don't want you to know about. Uh, and then the counter argument is that's all very well, but they want to do things they don't want you to know about outside the police station. And there's somebody there with a cell phone with a video camera. And so you end up with a big demonstration against some police doing something bad. So, so, so it's not clear quite how far it goes, but, but yes, it's an interesting world. And it's an attractive world in some ways and an unattractive world in others, just like my strong privacy world is. Uh, and they, the, the line from one of the cypherpunks a long time ago was encryption is not your friend. No technology is your friend, right? Technologies are neutral. They're, they're just there and they can have good and bad effects. Uh, and in the case of, of the world of strong, of, of, of the, the, the transparent society, one thing is that it will be harder for police and government actors to do bad things without our knowing about it. Another thing is it will be easier for police and government actors to control us because they will know what we're doing. And that privacy is in a sense, if, if you don't, if your opponent has unlimited physical resources for compelling you, then privacy is really the only way of protecting yourself. And that goes away if you have a world of transparency. Yeah, if, if you have a transparent society. So like most of these things, it's good in some ways and bad in others. As I think I discussed somewhere in the book, there was a point when the FBI was asking for abilities for wiretapping when they were worried about the digital stuff making it harder. And it looked as though they wanted the ability to uh, tap something like a couple of million phones at once. And you say, well, how is that possible? And the answer is that there is speech to text software. There is, there is software for analyzing text. So in principle, you, if all you're looking at is communications, you could use your computers and your computers are listening to in the limit, every phone conversation in the, in the, in the country, they are spotting the particular text phrases that suggest something going wrong and one time in a million they refer it to a human being and then they catch whoever it is and that's sort of one possible vision uh, good or bad it, it, they, the government isn't necessarily on your side uh, but it's certainly one thing one thing that that could happen and that i think was set off by a scene in a movie uh where the implication was that somebody was tapping every phone in America. And uh, it turned out it was the phone company. And the phone company in that movie, it was completely roboticized that nobody had sort of noticed, but it had been entirely taken over by machines. Uh, so so, was the movie. so their know. bottleneck was that you couldn't listen to so many, so much data, like the big data. If, if, we listen, if, if all that is is phone calls, I think we, we, we have or nearly have the technology. But if it's everything everybody is doing, that's a much, much harder problem. So, you know, when somebody is in his basement fiddling with chemicals, how do you know what he's doing? And when he's doing nanotech design, which is one of the scary possibilities, how do you know what he's doing? So if you, if you really have a society where everybody's got the ability to do nanotech stuff, uh, then you have the possibility of the uh, high, high school psychopath creating a plague in his basement, which I discuss as many, many hypotheticals. So I don't know how, I don't know how you're going to evaluate all the information. If you imagine the transparent society and are really trying to keep bad things from happening, I think that's going to be very hard because there's such a huge amount of information out there to be evaluated. The ultimate saving us question, I think, comes down to how strong defensive technologies are versus offensive technologies. And that's going to, that's sort of an accident of a particular technology. So can we, can, if, if, if China would release all its nukes, I, I think there is no defensive technology that could do anything about that, right? Yeah, at, 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 the, at, at the moment, uh, but there could be. You could certainly imagine uh, anti-missile defenses, laser or something in orbit or something of like that good enough 
so that they could prevent uh, a ICBMs. Uh, and then you have to worry about somebody sailing a ship into your harbor with a bomb in it, and the crew leaves and the bomb blows up. So there are a variety of other of, 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 of less fancy delivery systems. But but no, I think I think we certainly were in a situation for quite a while where offense beat defense, and therefore you had to use the threat of retaliation to prevent catastrophe. And surprisingly enough, it worked. And we didn't blow up the world. And also blowing up the world was always an exaggeration. I think people overstated all of that. And as far as I can tell, if there had been a thermonuclear war, you know, in the 1970s or something, full scale one, the human race would have survived. Probably human civilization would have survived. It would have killed maybe half the population or two thirds of the population of the world, something like that. Well, that happened while the, the, the Black Death killed about 40% of the population, at least of Europe, over a period of extended period of time. So I think, I think in general that, that, that catastrophes make good drama and so people exaggerate them. And that's, I think, clearly true of all of these environmental catastrophes that I think, you know, it's, it's an open question whether global warming is a threat, but the idea that it's a threat that will wipe out civilization or wipe out the human race is just crazy. Uh, that, you know, there, there were mammals at a time when there was warmer uh, we weather. And, People worry about the possibility of the of, of, of the polar caps melting, and nobody seems to realize that the normal state of the Earth is to have no polar caps. A time when there is a polar cap is what we call an ice age. That's the geological definition of an ice age, when there's ice on one or both poles. We happen to have been in an ice age for the last three million years, so we treat it as normal that the Earth is several billion years old. Uh, so I think people exaggerate a whole lot of this. But on the other hand, I would be rather unhappy, you know, to have a catastrophe which only half the people I knew died. Uh, and so I'd rather it not happen. But, but I think, anyway, you know, it, it makes a good dramatic story to talk about at the end of the world and people sitting in New Zealand waiting for the world to end. But in fact, as far as I can tell, the evidence we have on the effect of thermonuclear war was it would never have really sterilized the planet. That wasn't one of our options, fortunately. Well, the world is getting better and better as far as I, I can see. And what can get even better in the future is your online privacy. So how can this, how can, how can, how we might have online privacy in the future, like complete privacy um, as far as I understand and, and, and it changed from your your vision from 1996 in the strong world of strong privacy then you had three technologies but those three technologies are not the same what you're talking about lately mm -hmm. um, if I remember it was uh, private public key encryption and and anonymous cash right and the third one what you what what you called the third one was vr but now what what you think it should be more like reputation systems right can you talk about this did it change your thinking no, I, think, I think both of those the point of the the point of the vr is that it's a way of moving more and more of life into cyberspace that if you have a world where encryption means that cyberspace is private and surveillance means that real space is public, then the balance between them largely depends on how much of life is lived in cyberspace and how much in real space. And the limiting case, uh, which I sketch in Future Imperfect, I don't know if I mentioned it uh, earlier, is the world where everything is, is virtual and where everybody's lit, lying, his body is in a little cell, but that doesn't really matter because the cell provides him food and physical exercise. And, and his mind is entirely in a virtual world. And that could be entirely private. Uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, I'm trying to remember, I've now lost track of you were saying that virtual reality was, was, was one of the possible abilities. And what was the other one you were saying that you thought I was concerned That's about? Reputation system. Reputation, yeah. That that has to do with the problem uh, in a world of privacy of how you enforce contracts. In general, how you enforce law, but in particular enforce contracts. And I've been writing about that for a long time. 
so I don't I don't remember if I had anything of that in '96, but I certainly did fairly early. Uh, and the answer I think is that you 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 do it by having mechanisms such that people have reputations, other people can check your reputation, your reputation is valuable, and there are ways in which if you cheat, you, you lose reputation. So that I've sketched out a long time ago uh, mechanisms for enforcing contracts where, and of course mine is sort of a, a sketchy, a sketchy view. What the real, just as when I talk about encryption, I generally talk as if you were encrypting with your private key and decrypting with your public key, but I gather that as a practical matter, it's much easier to encrypt the key to a single key cipher with your private key, and they decrypt it with your public key, and then you you encipher the thing with the with the single key one, which is much quicker and, and, and easier to do. So there are lots of complications I leave out because they aren't important, but, but, the, uh, but I think the basic log logic of it is that the nice thing about online, the online world is it's entirely voluntary association. And in a world of voluntary association, reputation works very well because you've had a bad, bad reputation, nobody associates with you. Uh, so, and there are examples. Now, the interesting, uh, one of the examples that I've discussed is the uh, case of the New York diamond market where you had a uh, market with a whole lot of high dollar value trust transactions that was working entirely on reputation enforcement. And that's apparently broken down. I, somebody I was uh, on something with was pointing me at an article on the breakdown of that system. It's not entirely clear why it broke down, but it lasted for quite a long time. So I don't think I have any guarantees out there. Uh, the, but y'all know if you, if, if in so, but if I go back for a moment, I don't think the VR and the reputation are really alternatives because you have the world of VR, you still need a way of enforcing your deals. And so reputation is going to be how you're going to, I think how you're going to do it. Uh, and of course, reputation can include things like bonding mechanisms so that as long as there's somebody you can trust, if I want to, I want to hire you to write a computer program for you, for, for me. And the problem is that you don't know that I can be trusted to pay you after you write it. And I don't know that you can be trusted to write it after I pay you. And the solution to that would be to have a third party who we both do trust, who is our escrow agent. And so I give him the money for the project with the understanding that he will check when you finish it, that he will look at it and see, yes, indeed, it's what was described in the contract and then release the money to you. Uh, so that's a way in which you can leverage uh, reputation. You can, as it were, hire somebody else's reputation. Uh, but it does seem to me that, it's, that if you have repeat players, there's an incentive to develop reputation and that, that ought to therefore be a, a workable a way in which that world, that world will work. But it's perfectly, it perfectly makes sense, even in practice, in in online economy, you can see um, not the brightest example, but the dark markets are basically completely mutually untrusting. No one trusts anyone. Everyone is anonymous or rather pseudonymous, so they can keep their identity. So the discipline of constant dealings. Uh, but but never mind. So I, 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 let, let me let me zoom zoom back from the exactly. you can prove your identity by using your 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 private key. That is, you have the option if you want to have a, a fixed identity. You have the option if you want to have a fixed online identity without giving away your real space identity. All you do is you sign everything you do with your with your private key. Uh, you've published your public key and then everybody knows that's you. Mm -hmm. So you have the option of doing that if you want to. I don't know if people do. I, I've, I've had no dealing with the dark net. So, um, stuff and you know I've known about encryption for a very long time but I don't have a whole lot of secrets that I want to hide <laughs> I, I don't know much about that either it, it started out the dark nets are started out with Silk Road which was a very idealistic libertarian thing they even had a book club but lately they they ended up being like only used for fraud and these kind of things yeah. But so uh, one of the things, one of the things that I discussed in Future Imperfect was my business plan for Murder Incorporated, and that was an example of the way in which the same technology could be used to do bad things, namely the higher hitmen. Uh, again, encryption isn't your friend or your enemy; it's just there, uh, and it 
but but it may but it, but if you want to understand sort of what how the society is likely to go, you want to explore what are the ways it could be used, and those include some very desirable things and some very undesirable things. Oh, of course, I mean the I I brought up the darknet markets because that gives us uh, who are we? You are an economist, and I'm um, an independent thinker. Mm. It gives us some very valuable real world data that if our models really stand for the real space. And actually, now that I think about it, that their identity was was only the darknet market in itself. So there was no public key encryption. But then as the darknet markets were shut down by the FBI and all kinds of law enforcement agencies, the vendors figured out that they have to use encryption in order to prove their identity and reputation in a market that's probably going to be shut down in a year. So, so anyhow, never mind. Uh, Has anybody you... written up the dark nets? Has there been any scholarly work looking at the history of the dark net and how it worked and such? Because that would be very interesting. I think so, but I'm not that involved right. in that, so I didn't look at the literature. But anyhow, how I make sense to this whole thing is that if my three technologies, probably the same as yours, uh, anonymous cash, right? That's, that's essential for the world of strong privacy. Yes. Anonymous communication. It's not really public private key cryptography. That's an implementation detail. Anonymous communication is probably what's, what's most important and reputation systems. And these can create a circular online economy that has a word of strong privacy. So that's how we could get there. Yes. But only for transact only for information transactions only for things where you don't have to deliver physical objects but where you're delivering code or music or entertainment or uh, expert advice but once you start getting into real space now you can't fully protect it with encryption well maybe maybe the more more interesting thing is that does it really matter because as as you say that the online world is going to be more and more relevant in the yes. future. So information transactions are going to be the, the majority of the, of all transactions, right? But we still have to eat. We, we still have to eat. Uh, maybe we don't, we'll see. Uh, who knows? When we're, what uploaded, we still, when we're uploaded, we still need an electric connection. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, People think AI is coming, but we're gonna be AI. <laughs> Maybe that's that's uh, one 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 solution to the problem. In fact, two solutions. One of them one of them is the uploading, and the other is the idea that we will have mind to machine links so that we can do more and more of our thinking in silicon. I mean, you're already doing that to the extent that you're using your cell phone to or your computer to keep as a substitute for your memory. But we'll yeah. be better maybe all right so of these three technologies i think anonymous communication is already here even facebook is being forced to encrypt their their communication like like i think anonymous communication is already here and that's just a matter of time for user adoption do you agree with that there's, there's two different things one of them is conversation which other people can't read. And that's been available for a long time if you wanted to go to the trouble of using the encryption. Uh, there's been you know, free, as I'm sure you know. Uh, but the other is, is communication people can't trace. And that's a harder problem. And that one you could do if there's a network of anonymous remailers. But just having encryption doesn't give you that because they still say that I said blah, 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 to you even though I don't know what Blu-ray actually is. Uh, okay, that's a good point. That's a good point. We we still don't have, I mean, of course we have even just sending a message through the Tor network uh, has, has anony anonymous communication in a way that who sends to who that's anonymous. Yes. Um, 
I yeah. haven't used that, so I don't know how good it is at this point. Yeah, so so what's getting adopted is only the what is being sent, not the who to who. I think that's coming too. It just needs we just need faster internet. Uh, anyhow, um, I think we can say now that the cyberpunks have won the war on encryption. Hmm. Is that correct? And I you're a cyberpunk. The attempts to 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 suppress encryption have clearly failed. That is the, the it, it's. I think. I, I have suggested that the National Security Agency may have written my World of Strong Privacy article before I did. That is to say, they may have seen those potentials. They didn't like them. They therefore attempted to push for policies in which everything had to have a backdoor. And as far as I can tell, they failed. That is, they've succeeded in putting backdoors in lots of things, not all of which one knows about but they have not there's no legal policy as far as i know in which any encryption that's being used has to have a way the government can read it so in that sense i think we've won i think the technology is on our side on the other hand very few people actually bother to encrypt their conversations so in that sense that world hasn't really we aren't really in a world where the normal inter, where the default interaction as it were is between two anonymous uh, people with anonymous text. Uh, and we've got the technology for that, but that requires everybody to be doing it, or most people be doing it, which hasn't happened. All right, so are, are you a cypherpunk? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure the cypherpunks exist anymore. Uh, I don't know in what sense I am. I was on the mailing list for a while. I got together in real space once with some of them. Uh, but I wasn't really very active on that, on that. So I certainly got some ideas from it. I am somebody who was on the cypherpunk mailing list. So I guess that's the closest that comes to it. But I don't think there was ever a membership list. It seems to me that would have gone against the spirit of the whole project. So you won the award on encryption. Congratulations. <laughs> Good. Yes, I think, I think, I think we have so far won. That's right. But we're getting undoubtedly the bad as well as the good with it. Uh. We're yeah. getting uh, ransomware attacks. Uh, I don't remember if I discussed that in print. I remember I certainly thought about the idea of ransomware quite a long time ago, uh, of the ways in which it could be done uh, using encryption. And, um, and of course, that's an interesting case because that's a case where reputational enforcement would actually work to help make a criminal, make, make a criminal activity work because if you want to, if I've if if, if I've uh, encrypted your your hard drive and, and 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 want to sell you the key back, it matters that I have a reputation for in fact giving you the real key, yeah. not taking the money and then saying, "Well, pay me again," and I'll, maybe I'll give it to you. Uh, but uh, uh, but yeah, no, I mean ransomware is part of the downside of this world, and. Uh, Murder Incorporated probably is. I don't think it actually exists, but I expect that there are some activities that are promoted through the secrecy that I disapprove of, uh, as well as ones I approve of. Uh, I suppose my guess is that these technologies are used for people who get lists of other people's uh, Visa card, credit card numbers, and then share them for people to fraudulently use. Uh, so there are certainly going to be downsides of any technology, but there are also upsides. Uh, since I think it's pretty clear that governments both steal more and kill more people than private individuals under present circumstances. And so reducing the power of government on net is likely to be a benefit, even though it's going to have some costs. You, you talked about previously that governments may end up being more like Landlord. landlords. Than That's right. If you, have, if you have a full, sort of a full VR kind of world, where it doesn't really matter, it doesn't even have to be that far. If almost everything you're being done, doing is done online, it doesn't matter very much where you live. Uh, I mentioned that I'd been told that I could probably claim Hungarian citizenship if I wanted to, and it's a little bit tempting because, after all, if things got really bad in the U.S., which doesn't seem very likely, but it's always possible, uh, Budapest is a nice city and they've got internet connections. So since large parts of what I do with my life are done online, I could do those things anywhere. 
not literally anywhere, but anywhere with good internet connections. Uh, some years ago, uh, my daughter and I traveled through India uh, on one of my speaking trips, and she was doing her business, which was being an online freelance editor, exactly the same way she would do it in a hotel in India as the way she would do it in a house at home. Uh, and, you know, I, I could read the same things and participate in the same conversations and so forth. So the more you get to a world where the important stuff is happening online, the less it matters where you live. And then all the government controls is the physical stuff. And then there can you have a situation where it's competitive landlords. Uh, now it's true that it's not perfect competition. Well, some, some landlords have advantages. Uh, I have a theory that part of the reason why taxes are so high in California is the weather is so good and therefore they can charge high taxes without driving people out. Uh, and in fact, I thought it would be an interesting research project. I've, I'm currently working on a book, maybe a couple of books coming out of my accumulated blog posts uh, as ideas. And one of the ones I haven't done but might is the idea of predicting government tax levels on the grounds of how attractive a physical place this is to live, since that determines the tax they can collect before driving people out of it. Do you uh, think it, it has any effect today other than the California case? I don't know. I haven't done the research. Uh, but I have a concept of what I think of as exploitive taxation. Taxation, which is not paying the cost of services that are worth that much to the, to, to the taxpayers, but rather transferring money from the taxpayers to somebody else. That somebody online was asserting, whether correctly, I don't know, uh, that the difference between high tax and low tax states in the U.S., was not the quality of government of, of, of public services, but how much the people providing the public services were paid. Mm. And if that, this is a particular example of schooling, so I don't know how general it is, but suppose that's true. You then interpret that as government employees are basically extorting the rest of us, in which case, how much can they extort us? Well, since the government controls whether you're inside the territory or outside the territory, the more valuable being inside the territory is so that the government as it were, the government is sort of a landlord, in effect, owned by government of ease, and then renting out the land to the rest of us, which is a sort of a weird way of thinking at it, but I found it intriguing. We might be living in a future where offline real-world activities will be completely surveilled, and online activities might be completely private, because we have yes. three technologies. Uh, anonymous communication, anonymous e-cash, and reputation systems that creates a private online circular economy. Yes. And as the relevance of the real world goes down and the relevance of the online world goes up, what really will matter is the privacy in the online world, which is going to be strong. So yes. that's how we can, we might be living in a world of strong privacy in the future. We might. And the original article can be found on my webpage. It was called A World of Strong Privacy. My book, Future Imperfect, which also discusses surveillance, which wasn't in that article, is on my webpage. And my webpage is daviddfriedman.com. So that's easy to remember. All right. All right. Thank you very much thank for you. this. And it, it was fun. Yeah, it was. Uh,